Welcome to this presentation. We're going to be covering uh, chapter 18 of our textbook. We're going to talk about drafting a contract and specific provisions that may be um, typically used in a contract, and we'll talk about uh, kind of what their functions are, what their level of importance are. So let's get started. Um, here we go. Okay, um, obviously as you are drafting language, you always ought to keep in mind what the parties are trying to accomplish. Uh, drafting a contract is a little bit different than other types of legal drafting that you do. Uh, for one thing, you're focusing on creating a document that in and of itself has legal effect. When you're drafting a motion, or you're drafting a pleading, or you're writing a letter to somebody, uh, the words that you use may persuade the person that you're writing to do something or to not do something, but the words in and of themselves don't have any inherent power. But when you're drafting contractual language, assuming the other side adopts that language, um, the nature of the relationship between the parties are going to change. And that's an important a difference between a contract drafting and other types of draft legal writing drafting that you might do. Another difference is that with contracts, um, you it is not necessarily, in fact, is usually not a adversarial position. Yes, by definition, there will be things that um, in interest your client or priorities for your client that the other side might not share. And to some extent, there's going to be a zero-sum game involved. So if your client is trying to sell uh, widgets to the other uh, other party, well, the more that you're able to persuade the other party to pay for the widget, the more money your client will end up having at the end of the transaction and the less money that the other side will have. So, yes, there certainly are aspects of contract drafting that are adversarial, but probably at least as important is the idea that usually when you're drafting a contract, the idea is that both parties see value in this arrangement and both parties have an incentive to uh, make the arrangement work. And so, yes, when you're drafting it, you're focused primarily upon advancing your own client's interests. But if you uh, think that it's going to be advantageous for your client to uh, trick or, or fool uh, the other side into something that is not advantageous, you might find that your client is frustrated with you because really your client sees oftentimes that doing uh, having a short-term advantage over the other side that will result in long-term damage to the relationship isn't uh, really what's in your client's best interest. So as you're thinking about drafting a contract, you want to make sure that it's a good contract for your client, but you also want to keep in mind that this is a long-term relationship and it may advance your client's interest to also consider the other side's perspectives. Um, typically, when you're drafting a contract, you're going to uh, borrow from some boilerplate uh, provisions that you have. So you'll be kind of um, uh, picking from one document here and another document here, almost like if you're designing an outfit. You might pick a skirt um, from, from one section of your closet and a, a blazer from another set of your closet. You might pick some shoes that you wear tr traditionally with another outfit and you put it together and the whole outfit works. Um, but you might have to, to make some adjustments. For example, um, perhaps uh, those that blazer works, but you need to uh, be sure that you uh, wear a certain shirt underneath it that's going to bring out the color in the skirt or something along those lines. And so you're going to start with provisions from various documents, bring them together, but as soon as you do that, you're going to have to make adjustments to, to the document so that they fit together within this larger document. And that's uh, it, what becomes really important when you're making these adjustments is that you're proofreading carefully. Um, you know, for example, if you're if you're taking a paragraph from one document, um, it may mention the actual names of the parties in that document. So it may mention, you know, the Smith Company and the Green Company. But the contract that you're drafting is between ABC Company and DEF Company. So if you're if you take that language from the other contract in and don't make changes, it won't make any sense in the context, and it will be potentially embarrassing uh, for your client or and or if, if not embarrassing, it can cause ambiguity in the in the contract. So you want to make sure that you carefully, carefully read that language that you're bringing in from other sources. 
But it isn't just things like changing the names of the parties that you have to worry about. You have to worry about the flow of the document. Um, where are you going to put this this new section in to your document. You want to plan it out so it's a logical location and you want to see does it flow from section to section. Um, and if you spend time talking about um, the arbitration section, you probably want to discuss all aspects of dispute resolution in one area before you go on to another section. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're moving things around so that, that all the, the parts about a particular topic are together. And so you want to think about that, both kind of the, 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 the minutia, making sure everything is proof, but also the big picture, is the organization, the document sensible? Um, then, of course, you want your document to reflect um, the fact that we're living in a world where um, uh, transactions occur over the Internet pretty routinely. If you're using an older model, you may find that some of the provisions are have not are not a, appropriate still or at least they need to be redrafted to reflect the realities of the modern world. Um, now we'll, we're going to go through lots of different clauses. Not all of these clauses are going to work in every contract um, but these are, are common ones to have in your arsenal and so what you're likely to have is a file where you have the various provisions and then you'll, you'll, you'll cut and paste and pick and alter to fit the needs of your particular client. It's pretty rare that legal professionals will um, draft a whole contract from beginning to end and um, just just draft it out of your own, their own heads. Almost always significant portions will be taken from other documents. Um, if you were writing an English paper, that might be frowned upon. People might say, oh, you're plagiarizing. But in this case, it's completely appropriate. And in fact, it's expected that you will borrow from other contracts, other um, uh, contracts perhaps that you were involved with, maybe other contracts that your colleagues have been involved with. There's no uh, suggestion that that is inappropriate at all. And in fact, it would be inappropriate not to do that. That because if you were to have to write each provision out on your own, number one, the provisions probably won't be as good as, as kind of time-tested provisions that you get from these contracts, number one. And number two, it's going to be much more expensive for your client because, you know, after all, every hour you spend drafting it is more money that your client has to spend. Here's a list of some common contractual provisions. Um, each one of these has um, broad utility uh, you'll find them used in many, many different situations, but not all these provisions will work in every single contract. For example, you're not going to have a liquidated damages provision in every single contract. You're not going to have a restricted covenant in every single contract. You aren't going to have an arbitration agreement in every single contract. Um, you won't have a time of is of the essence in every single contract. You won't have limitations on liability in every single contract. Um, so many of these things won't be in every contract, but still, it's good to know how these work. And keep in mind that every single one of these provisions is pretty routinely used in a contract, depending upon exactly what that contract is designed to accomplish. So let's go through them and discuss them individually. Okay, the identity of the parties. You're going to want to have this in every single contract. Of course, if it's a very short contract, this can be very, very brief, and it probably will be relatively brief, no matter how long your contract is. You're wanting to uh, describe the parties. In this case, one party is ABC Corporation. And then you might, in parentheses, define it. Um, this is a, uh, this explains to the reader of the contract that wherever the, the, uh, the parties or the reader sees ABC, what that, what you really mean is ABC Corporation. And wherever the parties see seller with a capital S, it's another way of referring to the ABC Corporation. Um, so there's really three different terms that we now have for this particular party. We can describe it as ABC Corporation, we can describe it simply as ABC, or we can describe it as seller with a capital S. And it, again, the parentheses and the quotations marks are what tells us these are alternative definitions for it. It's important to note that this letter is capitalized. If the word seller appears elsewhere in the contract, but it's um, lowercase, it does not necessarily refer to ABC Corporation. Only when it is uppercase does it refer to ABC Corporation. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Now you may wonder, why do you actually give an alternative definition? Why don't you just write out ABC Corporation every time? That's not necessarily a bad idea. Um, 
but I guess part of the idea is that it can become cumbersome, especially if it's a long corporate name. This isn't a long corporate name, but if you had something more involved, um, you know, let's say this stands for the Alphabetical Basement Company Corporation Incorporated or something, you could see how that would be kind of a mouthful or a fingerful to write out each time. And so it's pretty common to have abbreviations like this. Um, and so you want to define all the parties who are parties of the contract, and you're likely to have this in your first paragraph, not just your client, but any other parties that are involved. And um, you may choose to do it by just abbreviating some aspect of the name, like what we did here, or you may decide to define it based upon uh, the role that the particular party has in the transaction. In this case, obviously, ABC is the seller, and there may be another company, we'll say another company is you know, DEF company, and we're going to define it as DEF, oops, or capital B buyer. And of course, you can have more than two parties, but here's an example of just the two parties that you might use. It's also a good idea to give the legal status of the party. So here you might say, after ABC Corporation, you might say a corporation. And let's say uh, DEF corporate company, and we're going to say it's an LLC. We'll say LLC. And you might even say a limited liability company. Now, strictly speaking, you wouldn't have to say this because LLC mem means limited liability company. And technically, you wouldn't have to say corporation because obviously, because ABC Corporation has a name corporation in it, it has to be a corporation. But you'll want to at least in some mechanism, either through the name of the entity or through a description afterwards, say what the, the nature of that legal status is. Let's say that, um, that we're talking about a human being. Let's say it's Bob Smith. And you might define that as Smith or employee. And uh, you wouldn't have to define Bob Smith. I mean, it's obviously it's a human being. Um, but you might say an employee of ABC Company. That could be one way of going about doing that. Or you could say an individual. Then you're going to have a definition section. I say you're going to have a definition section next, but there's really two common areas to find a definition section. Um, one is very early on in the uh, contract, um, really before you get to the substance of the agreement. That's probably the most common place for it, um, but there is a trend in the legal community to move the definition sections to basically the end of the contract, to make it almost a glossary. And the, the idea is that nobody sits down and reads a whole list of definitions, um, that it's referred to as a person needs to, to dip into that list of terms. And so to put it at the beginning kind of suggests that you ought to start by going through definition by definition. But you could have a contract with hundreds of definitions, at least dozens of definitions in it. And so it, it, by starting with that, and given the fact that there's a section you really don't expect people to read from beginning to end, it kind of uh, interferes or, or uh, messes up the flow of the document. And so as long as you capitalize the terms that you've defined in the glossary, in the body of your contract, it's fine to put the actual definitions at the end in the glossary. You just have to be consistent because you want the person who's reading the contract to realize, hey, this term is defined somewhere. And the way to signal that is going to be by capitalizing the word. So you're going to want to define terms in your definition sections that the parties are using in a special way or when the term is kind of inherently vague and you are adding more precision to that term. Or sometimes when the term is especially important, it's so important that you, that you have a very, very clear meaning of this, you're willing to spend kind of a little bit of space making it crystal clear what the definition is. Here's an example, but there's you know, hundreds of them. This example, you see termination, so you put the term in, in quotations, and of course because it begins a sentence, you capitalize it, but you would have capitalized it even if it's not the beginning of the sentence. Termination occurs when either party, pursuant to a power created by agreement or law, I'm actually going to put a comma here. I think this makes it better. Puts an end to the contract otherwise than for its breach. 
And so this is the definition wherever we have in our contract, we have the word termination capitalized. That's a signal to the reader, hey, wait a second, we're in the middle of this of the sentence and we have a capital T in termination. This must be a defined term. Let me flip to the definition sections, be at the beginning of the contract or the end to find out the, the specific meaning. Let me give another example. Let's say that in this contract, you are using the word child. Well, most of the time when we use the child, we, me we mean that to mean somebody under the age of 18. But as soon as we use the word child in English to refer to the offspring of somebody, but that offspring might be an adult. For example, I am the child of my parents, even though obviously I'm over the age of 18. So the word child is inherently ambiguous. So you might define it here as child is someone under the age of 18. And so in this way, we've defined the word child to exclude me because I'm over the age of 18. Um, and so that's an example of how you might use the term. Now, this definition of child, child is someone under the age of 18, is not controversial. Um, it's a very common definition of child. But you can, in a contract, define a term in a way that is quirky. You could define a, the word to mean child is someone, we'll say, between the ages of 25 and 30. Now that would be strange because that someone is, it, the normal definition of child doesn't include that. The point I'm trying to make is that when you define a term, the ordinary definition of the term ceases to, ceases to be relevant. If you happen to define the word child in your a contract to mean someone being between the ages of 25 and 30, that's what it means for the purpose of this contract. And so if, if in the contract somewhere you mention somebody who's 17, you can't call that person a child because they don't meet the definition. So you can have a definition that actually contradicts the ordinary meaning of a word. Or it can be a term that you're using more broadly than that word ordinarily means or more narrowly than that a word is narrowly intended to mean. Let's talk about representations and conditions. Um, you want to, or it's, it's advantageous, especially if it's a contract that is involving a significant uh, amount, it's significantly important to the client, maybe involving a significant dollar amount. That you may want to list all the material facts, excuse me for this S here, that S shouldn't be here, and the representations that your client is relying upon. Let's say that the other side has made certain commitments to you. You want to make sure that they're reflected in the actual contract. If they've said something like, you know, all of our widgets are blue, you want to go ahead and say, well, the representation that we've received is that all the widgets that we'll get will be blue. Um, it's important to list all that because if one of those representations that you heard verbally doesn't pan out, but you don't reference it in the contract, and according to the parole evidence rule, you may be, you know, in a world of hurt because you've relied upon that. It was important to you, but because you didn't memorialize it in the actual agreement, the fact that what you actually get doesn't meet that representation, it may be difficult for you to, uh, not impossible, but difficult for you to, to successfully argue that, that that representation is meaningful. So you want to include as much as possible. You also want to talk about conditions. Of course, we talked about conditions precedent and conditions subsequent, and we talked about concurrent conditions. Um, uh, it's fairly common for a contract to have these conditions. If this happens, then this happens, you know, um, and you want to make those very clear. Um, these are examples of conditional words that are commonly used in these situations. Um, if you use these words and you aren't meaning to convey the idea of a condition, you probably want to change the word because these are going to create the expectation that a condition is happening subsequently. Let me just do a refresher about a condition. A condition precedent means that something has to happen before I have the obligation. So, for example, if I am going to buy somebody's car in a month, but a condition precedent has to be that I can obtain financing to buy the car. And if I don't obtain financing to buy the car, then I don't have an obligation to buy the car. That would be a condition precedent. You can also have a condition subsequent. This would be a situation in which I have an obligation to do something up to, up, to an, uh, up to the moment that the condition subsequent happens. When the condition subsequent happens, if it does happen, I no longer have an obligation. So going back to the example of me buying a car, in this case, um, a condition subsequent might be I have an obligation to buy the car in 30 days. 
as long as I'm still employed. So a condition subsequent would be me losing my job. If I lose my job before the date that I have to buy the car, or I'm supposed to buy the car, then I am relieved of my obligation to buy the car. So again, you want to make sure when you're using conditional language, you really mean it to be a true condition. The duration, good idea to mention the duration of the contract if it's a contract that isn't going to, you know, be for a one-time sale of goods. Obviously, in that situation, it's pretty obvious what the time period is going to be. And so you're going to want to schedule the dates, establish a, a mechanism that's going to establish when the dates are going to be. Maybe it's going to be something that happens uh, once a month or once a week. Well, you want to specify, you know, what day of the week is it going to be? What day of the month is it going to be? You're also, if this is a long-term relationship, you want to establish some mechanism for renewing the contract. Let's say it's a janitorial contract. Well, you're going to need to have janitorial service for an indefinite period of time into the future as long as the business is going. But you're probably not going to want to commit to a particular janitorial relationship for 50 years because you don't know what's going to happen in the future and, and the janitorial service probably doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. On the other hand, uh, you know, you may decide to, to have it be a one-year agreement, but you may still, with a one-year agreement, want to have some kind of mechanism that's going to automatically continue it. Um, you don't want something to show up at work and, hey, the trash hasn't been in, emptied for a week. Um, if And you think to yourself, well, I meant to continue that janitorial contract. I, I just didn't, and somehow now we don't have any janitorial services. So many times having the automatic renewal provision can work. Of course, it can be bad, too, because if you want to get out of that contract, typically automatic renewal provisions will give you a window of time that you can say, hey, I don't want to continue this relationship. If you don't act during that window, though, many times the contract will uh, automatically renew for um, a period of perhaps a year before you're going to be able to exit again. So you want to make sure that um, if it is automatically renewing, the, the way that it renews is something that you're going to be satisfied with. Obviously, there's going to be consideration in any type of contract or you're not going to have a contract. Um, but you'll want to make sure that the consideration for both parties or all the parties are included so it's obvious on the face of the contract that you have a valid contract. You're going to want to provide the amount, provide the amount that's going to be paid, when it's going to be due, who's supposed to receive it, and if there are any conditions, either conditions subsequent or conditions precedent for the payment. Make all that clear. This doesn't have to all happen in the same paragraph, um, but you'll have to have this somewhere in the agreement. You may have an installment payment situation in which um, there's going to be, you know, a starting balance, and then over time the person pays a little bit down, pays a little bit more down, and um, they satisfy the debt. Many times in an installment uh, contract, you're going to have an acceleration clause. You don't have to, but it can be a an advantageous thing for the seller. It's going to be a note that says, if an installment payment is not met um, at the time that it's supposed to, the entire amount can come, become due at that time. So this can be uh, rather draconian. Uh, so it may be something that you negotiate with the other side. The other side may not agree to it, but it's something worthy of consideration, especially if you are the seller who is going to be get an advantage by having that acceleration contract. You can also have kind of the reverse of an acceleration contract. You can have a mechanism where a person can prepay and actually get a discount for that prepayment. Um, and so you may want to talk about that provision. So you, you'll want to work out in the contract if there's an installment aspect to it. What happens if a payment is late and what happens if a payment is early? Uh, again, it's so important that you anticipate all these different permutations. It's almost more important that you anticipate them than that you like what the answer is because when both parties know what the deal is, then they know how to play that game. And the likelihood of there being a breach or a, or a problem between the parties significantly um, is reduced. Uh, you want to establish a time for performance, and you want to talk about what the performance is. Um, if I'm supposed to perform a service, we want to talk in detail about how that uh, performance will be accomplished. So let's say I'm supposed to paint someone's barn. You want to talk about, well, what kind of paint am I going to use? Um, what kind of prep work am I going to be required to do? Will I have to strip the paint that's already there? Will I have to plane any wood so there's a flat surface? Um, 
Will I be painting the inside only or the outside? What will, what will be my responsibilities in terms of a touch-up or the finishings? Is there um, sections that I'm not supposed to paint that I'm supposed to leave bare? Um, is there woodwork or things that I'm supposed to cover? Um, things like that. You'll want to address all of those issues so that um, – my performance can be measured. If I fail to do some of those things, then I might be in breach of the contract. But you want to make it crystal clear what qualifies as a breach and what qualifies as performance. Um, so you also want to, in addition to uh, make, establishing what the activity is, you want to make sure that you establish the timing. When do I? When am I supposed to do this uh, barn painting? When am I supposed to stop? Start? When am I supposed to be completed with the task? And of course, the location. Um, you know, where's the address of the barn? Is it the whole barn? Is it only a portion of the barn? Is it just the inside, just the outside? You ought to work out any potential problems that can happen. Um, let's say, oh, sorry about that. Let's say that, um, here we go. Let's say that, um, it, th you're supposed to paint the outside of the barn. Well, obviously you can't do that in bad weather. Um, so that might be a provision that you have that there has to be, um, you know, you are excused from performing on days that it rains, you know, half an inch or more or whatever the standard might be. So you'll want to anticipate those types of, of um, details, not just weather related. There can be lots of other problems with performance. Let's say that um, there's a strike. A, a work stoppage in my facility. Well, how am I going to handle that type of thing? Um, you know, what, what what will the contract provide in those cases? And again, it's important that you have anticipated the problems, the particular solution you and, and the other side arrive at. Um, it, it, certainly, uh, that's the subject of negotiation, but you want to make sure whatever that decision is, that it's um, accurately and completely described in the contract. Let's talk about the term force majeure. I know we talked about this earlier. This is a provision in the contract that establishes that, you know what, an act of, jo an act of God, and I don't mean this in a religious sense, but a, a natural disaster, an unforeseen big event is going to excuse non-performance. So if there's a hurricane, let's say we live in uh, New Orleans and there's a hurricane that hits, um, when I'm supposed to perform the contract, I'm going to be excused from performing because of the force majeure uh, provision. Now, I will tell you that courts routinely will write in a force majeure a provision um, if the parties leave it out, unless the parties specifically contract to not have a force majeure provision. So you don't have to have it to get the effect, but it makes sense to include it. That way you can provide more specificity to it. You know, what is an act of God? Certainly a hurricane would be, but a strike really isn't an act of God. Those are human beings deciding not to work. A war isn't an act of God. Those are human beings decide to fight each other. Usually if there's a disruption in raw materials, it's because of some human thing. I mean, it could be some natural disaster, but you can see um, the, the term force majeure really extends beyond natural disasters. And even with respect to natural disasters, okay, a hurricane is a natural disaster, but what about a heavy rainstorm? Is that a force majeure? In certain situations, it might be. In certain situations, it might not be. So it makes sense to define it as precisely as you can. So, you know, if you don't want to include the minor um, weather disturbances, then you, you can require that performance not be excused under those circumstances. Let's look at limitations on liability. Of course, limitations on liability are a little bit risky for the parties to have because um, if you have an exculpatory clause that is too... Um, uh, to uh, excusing of one party, a court can find that it's unconscionable. Let's say that I'm building a house for you, and um, it's a million-dollar house, and the clause says that if I, um, no matter how badly I breach, the most that you can sue me for is $100, um, but you've paid me a million dollars for it. Um, in terms of, of the, the, the payments that I've received to date. Well, certainly that would be a very lopsided um, exculpatory clause, and I think under those extreme court circumstances, the court might well find it unconscionable. Not all exculpatory clauses are unconscionable, and they can make sense for one side to bear greater risk than the other. That can be part of the negotiation. Maybe one side is better able to bear the risk than the other. So 
it's not automatic, but it is definitely something to think about as you're drafting it. Um, you can obviously have another a force majeure uh, provision. That's another way to limit liability. And you can also have a liquidated damages clause, and we'll talk about that, um, I think, in another slide. Let me make sure we have a liquidated damages one here before I say that. Yes, we do. Okay, that's coming up. That's also a limitation of liability, but that's a different, somewhat different. Okay, terminations provisions. You're going to want to have a mechanism that's going to end the contract, most likely. Um, again, it may be a date that ends. It may be a particular event, and then that situation would be a condition subsequent. Um, here's some examples. If anyone enters into a bankruptcy, if anyone breaches, that's kind of an intrinsic that if you have a breach. But it's not a bad idea to include that as a specific provision. You may have upon notice, so I give 30 days notice and I can be out of the out of the contract. Or it may be upon notice under certain circumstances. For example, there may be a 30-day window every year that I can give notice that I want to terminate the contract and it will terminate, say, 30 days after I give the notice. Um, but that's the only window that I can that my notice is effective. If I don't, if I give notice outside of that window, it's not effective notice. It doesn't do anything. If I don't give notice in the window, the contract automatically um, renews. So there can be lots of different ways of drafting this. Um, and again, it's a point of negotiation between the parties. You just want to make sure you have a solution to that in the contract. Let's talk about indemnification. Um, First of all, let's talk about what indemnification is. Um, it's when you indemnify someone, you are saying, I agree to compensate you if you have a loss. Um, and of course, the person who's agreeing to do that is the indemnitor. It's very common to have contracts with indemnification provisions. Let me give you an example of how one might work. Imagine that Toro, the lawnmower manufacturer, enters into a contract with Walmart. And in the contract, Toro agrees to to uh, 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 send to Walmart stores to very, and of course, this would be specified how many stores get how many um, lawn mowers and what models. But anyway, a significant number are going to be sent to lots of different Walmart stores, and of course, Walmart then plans to sell those to members of the public. Now, when Walmart sells those lawn mowers, they're actually, we'll say, in a box. And Walmart actually hasn't opened that box. So they, they have a display model so that customers can look at the Toro lawn mower, see its features, roll it around, and see how much it weighs, that type of thing. But what the lawn mower that the actual consumer is going to get is in a box that was sealed at the Toro factory and hasn't been opened since. So let's say that I buy one of these Toro lawnmowers from Walmart. I take it home. Um, I operate it, and it malfunctions. It catches on fire. I get burned. My yard is burned. Maybe my house catches on fire. I want to sue somebody. My first thought is I want to sue Walmart because that's where I went to buy it. And, of course, Walmart, Walmart has a very deep pocket, so it makes, uh, Walmart makes for a very good defendant. But you know that provision, that contract that Toro entered into with Walmart pres presumably had a uh, provision in it for indemnification. Since Toro's the entity that uh, gets to, uh, you know, develop the engineering process and gets to inspect and quality control the the lawnmowers as they go off the assembly line, it makes sense that if there's a problem with the uh, Toro lawnmower that I bought, that Toro ought to be the one who is going to ultimately pay. And, of course, Walmart is going to want to be indemnified because, again, Walmart will say, how are we supposed to know if that lawnmower was good quality or not? We count on Toro to worry about that. So that's the way the provision would be written. Now, I am a... I'm a really an incidental beneficiary to the contract between Toro and Walmart. I don't have privity with Toro and Walmart. When I buy the item from Walmart, I have privity with Walmart, but I never have privity with Toro under this transaction. So when I sue, I might sue Walmart, just Walmart, perhaps. I might also sue Toro, but let's assume I sue just Walmart. Well, then Walmart is going to um, a third party in Toro, so there's now... Uh, Groover versus Walmart versus Toro, and it's going to seek indemnification. But let's say Toro is going through difficult times. It's on the verge of bankruptcy, and actually 
while my lawsuit is progressing, Toro files for bankruptcy. Well, I'm thinking to myself, I don't really, I mean, it's okay to sue Toro. I'm not against that, but Walmart's the deep pocket here. That's who I want to collect a judgment against. Well, the indemnification provision between Walmart and Toro does not affect me, the consumer, at all. I can sue Walmart, and if I get a big judgment against Walmart, Walmart then presents that judgment to Toro. If Toro doesn't have any money, the indemnification provision doesn't doesn't work obviously but that doesn't mean that Walmart still doesn't have to pay me if I have a judgment against it so indemnification is only as good as the economic position of the indemnitor but it's still a very good thing to have and you can see how it's routinely used typically the person who indemnifies is the person who controls uh, whatever might go wrong in that particular situation Time is at the essence clause. This, of course, you put it in, in a contract to communicate, hey, we care about the time frame. Let's say that um, I am a contractor in um, Rio for the, uh, the Summer Olympics. Um, you know, if I'm supposed to build a stadium for the Summer Olympics, it's important that it be finished, you know, by the time the Summer Olympics rolls around. If I get it completed three months later or even three days after the Olympics is over, it's really not that useful for uh, the city of Rio de Janeiro to have. So time is of the essence is going to be very, very important in that situation. Other times, so it may not be so urgent. Let's say that instead of it being something being built for the uh, Olympics, um, a contractor is building a house for me. I may want it to be finished by a particular date, but in most cases, it won't be a huge issue if I, if it gets delayed by a week or a month or you know uh, some period of time. And so it may be that time isn't of the essence in every single contract. I will tell you that courts. Um, Oftentimes, we'll enforce time as of the essence provisions, but they also do kind of apply a rule of reasonableness. Um, if you have a deadline that doesn't seem like it was realistic when it was entered into, the court may say, well, you know, what do you want? You have a, a, an unrealistic deadline and you have time as of the essence. The two don't really fit together. And so the court may, under those situations, say, you know, since you have two uh, parts of the contract that don't fit together too well, I'm going to give... Um, the parties who is um, taking a little bit longer some additional time liquidated damages again this is similar to the limitation on liability but the difference is that with the liquidated damages provision it might be actually greater than the amount of actual damages or it can be less than the amount of damages that the uh, the party actually received or experienced so why do we have liquidated damages provision? One of the advantages to it is it, it makes it very clear what the amount of damages will be. There isn't guesswork. Many times things end up in litigation not so much because there's a dispute about liability, but because they're just not sure what the damages are going to be. The plaintiff thinks the damages are super high and the defendant may concede that it breached, but it thinks its damages are quite a bit lower. Well, if you have a liquidated damages clause, there's no debate about it. That's what the amount is. And so assuming there is no dispute about whether a breach happened, you don't really even need to go to trial. You, the, the, the breacher says, okay, I breached. And oh yeah, this provision in the contract says I've got to pay this amount. So guess what? I'm going to pay this amount. There's no sense in me going uh, to the hassle of hiring an attorney to represent me in a case that I'm going to lose anyway. And so it can reduce the likelihood of litigation. It also can be a way that the parties can can kind of measure, hey, you know, this is what a breach is going to cost me. Do I really want a breach? Maybe I don't when I see in black and white what that number is going to be. So it can actually encourage compliance with the terms of the contract. Um, courts are not, however, going to enforce a liquidated damage provision if it appears to be punitive. If it seems to be on its face, significantly more than the actual damages that the party will experience. And so you want to make sure that it's not... Um, too inculpatory. You could we talked about the exculpatory clause. You could call this the inculpatory chart, a clause, the one that makes the, the party more more guilty than they really are. Um, liquidated damages provisions are very common, um, so it's not that the courts routinely will find these punitive. But you, you ought to have a rule of reason with it. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to know what the damages might be. They're very speculative. Well, courts are very reluctant to award speculative damages. 
Let me give you an example. This is from my practice. When um, I would settle employment law cases, many times we would have a confidentiality provision in it. And the provision would say, you know, uh, would list the people that the plaintiff could, could get, tell about the settlement. Typically, it would be the plaintiff's spouse, um, the plaintiff's attorney, his or her financial advisor. There might be a few other people, but it wouldn't be his former colleagues at work. It wouldn't be people in the general public, things like that. But let's say that the, the, the former plaintiff, the, the former employee, signs the, con, the, the, the agreement. Let's say it's a, he got $10,000 out of the agreement, and he has accepted that confidentiality provision. But this is somebody who just can't uh, zip his lip. He, he tells people, oh, I got $10,000. Um, or you know, people ask him, hey, how, how come you got a new car? Well, I got $10,000 from the employer for this reason or that reason. And so he has breached the terms of the confidentiality provision. If there wasn't a liquidated damages clause in the contract, it would be very difficult for the employer to prove that that breach actually resulted in the employer being out a sum of money. Um, because after all, how can you prove? It? So maybe what happens after one of um, Bob's coworkers hears the fact that Bob got $10,000, then that coworker says, well, I'm going to sue the employer. Um, but uh, would that employee have sued anyway? Possibly. Um, that may not have been the important factor that resulted that caused the employer to want to that employee to sue. That's very difficult to prove, and so that's why it's almost impossible to prove um, damages from that breach of confidentiality. And that's why typically when you have a confidentiality provision, the damages are so speculative, but you still put in a dollar amount. Uh, or, you, or the reason you put it on is because the damages are so speculative. It's pretty common to have a liquidated damages provision that's, say, half of the total amount of, of, um, of award that the person gets. And that's probably pretty reasonable. You can even have it up to 100% of the award. I think if you go over 100%, um, so let's say Bob gets to $10,000, but you have the liquidated damages provision be $15,000. That's when the courts, I think, are going to look at that and go, that looks kind of punitive to me. Restrictive covenants. Um, we talked about these um, when we were talking about our, in a previous chapter. Um, these um, are enforceable generally in Texas, but they have to be drafted carefully. So when you're doing restrictive covenants, especially when they're in the employment context, you want to make sure that you're up to speed with the latest case law in this area because it is definitely an evolving area in the state of Texas. Um, uh, Typical times that you have restricted covenants are when somebody is your employee or sometimes at the end of their employment or you're selling a business uh, to somebody and you don't, you know, if you're, if, if I'm buying your bakery business, I don't want you to open up a competing bakery next door. That's going to really cut into my profits because one of the things that you're selling me when you sell me your bakery is you're selling me your goodwill, uh, your reputation. Um, and so people are going to continue to come into my bakery well, your, your former bakery, now my bakery, for some period of time because that's where they're used to going. And maybe they even think that uh, the, the same owner is there. Um, I, I'm hoping to continue and to, to keep those uh, customers as my customers. But if you open a competing bakery close by, well, my chance of doing that are significantly reduced. Um, so a restrictive covenant is definitely a possibility. As I said, it's it's possible for them to be enforceable in Texas, but it's not the easy state for enforceability. In California, they won't be enforceable at all. And, and you'll see everything from very easily to very easy to be enforced to, to California, the other extreme. So you want to make sure. Another thing to keep in mind is that if one of the parties isn't in Texas or, or the party might move out of Texas, you may want to consider the, if, how the enforceability will travel with the parties in the contract. Arbitration. Arbitration provisions are fairly common. Um, there's two ways you can have an arbitration clause. One way you can have it is pre-dispute. This might be in an employment contract or maybe in that contract between Toro and Walmart. Uh, they haven't had it. They don't have any 
problems with each other, they're happy with each other. They're entering into this contract. They're expecting both to make a lot of money. Um, and, but you still want to anticipate, well, what's going to happen if things turn south, something goes awry? And so it's smart to think those, those issues through. You don't have to have an arbitration clause, but especially in business-to-business -business contracts, it's very, very common. The advantages to arbitration over litigation are several. For one thing, it's usually quicker. It can be somewhat less expensive. Um, and it definitely will be private if the parties want it to be private. Um, the parties can kind of engineer how they want their disputes to be resolved. If you go through the court system, be it state or federal, you have to play by the rules of that jurisdiction. So it can give the parties a little bit more flexibility about going and set, deciding the case. Um, there are downsides to arbitration too. Probably the biggest one that general people talk about is that arbitrators try to, because since they get business based upon someone picking them to be in, in the arbitration or to be an arbitrator, they have an interest in being very middle of the road. If, if they're too pro plaintiff, then all the defendants will strike them from any arbitration panel. If they're too pro defendant, then all plaintiffs will strike them from the arbitration panel. And so as a result, you t tend to get arbitrators who kind of split the baby, who give a little bit to one side, a little bit to another side. If that's what you want, and sometimes it is what you want, then that can be a good solution. If though you think, well, no, I, I, if I'm going to win the case, if I'm entitled to win it in court, I don't want to end up not winning in an arbitration. But again, this is this can be a, a good a good approach to the wrong, right fact pattern. Oh, another advantage to arbitration, which I did not mention, is that um, while arbitration is definitely adversarial, it does create the possibility. Uh, for the parties to kind of maintain a business relationship or continue to maintain it and just put this one issue in arbitration aside. In other words, it's less um, adversarial, it's still adversarial, but it's less unpleasant, I guess you could say, less nasty than litigation can be. At least it has the, that potential. That's not always 100% true. Let's talk about merger clauses. You're almost always going to want to have a merger clause if it's a contract of any, kind of any scope. Um, really important. Um, to have a merger clause in it. And this is how you avoid the parole evidence rule. Another term for the merger contract is the integration clause. And this says, you know, everything that isn't written into this document is excluded. That's not a term of this agreement. And so all those representations that one party made to the other, if they don't find their way into the contract um, and you have a merger clause, all those representations were just so much wasted air. Um, and so you definitely want to have a merger clause because you don't want the pro you want the parole evidence rule to, to apply. You don't want it not to apply because as soon as you have it so that oral testimony comes in, then nobody knows really what the terms of the contract are because you don't know what the, the jury or the judge is going to do with this um, uh, parole evidence. And, and if, if it's allowed in, then who knows what the actual contract is. You want to have certainty about the terms of the contract. Choice of law and choice of form are also very popular. These are actually, they can be in one paragraph or one uh, section, but they can also be in separate sections. Um, typically, uh, in a choice of law, you want to specify, especially if the parties are from multiple jurisdictions, what state law is going to control in this particular circumstance. And it can be statutory law or it can be case law. Even if everybody's in the same state, say the state of Texas, you never know what the future holds. Some Someone might move to another state. You might as well make it crystal clear. Yep, we're talking Texas law here. So you want to specify that. You also want to specify a choice of forum. Now, if you've provided for arbitration already, um, it may not be necessary to have a cho choice of forum, although I've seen provisions that will say arbitration, and then they'll choose a, a choice of forum for a court that is very pro-arbitration so that if somebody for whatever reason ch just chooses not to use arbitration even though they're required to and they file it in a court then that court is going to be very open to a motion to compel the case into arbitration so it can be a an additional mechanism to get the case into arbitration um, so the, the form for example could be um, a state court in Collin County and again, this, 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 uh, the, the place you choose is going to be a place that's hopefully convenient for both parties, maybe where they are located primarily for business or maybe where the attorneys for, for one or both parties are, are located. And this again, this is the venue, and that's the choice of form would be the choice of venue. You've heard this term venue maybe in a federal civil procedure, a Texas civil procedure case. Um, it has a little bit different meaning when you're in a civil procedure class and you're here. This, what we're talking about here, is this is the assigned place that the, that 
the a person who wants to sue has to file the lawsuit. Assignability. We've already talked about in a previous chapter about how um, the, the right to assign is almost certainly going to, to exist in a contract. And that's the rule in the vast majority of um, uh, free economies, meaning non-managed uh, economies. Um, the only exception might be if personal services are involved. Uh, but it's still a good idea to specify, hey, yes, this is an assignable right. So let's say that um, uh, I uh, agree to, uh, or I, I pay you $100 and you agree to deliver to me um, a set of 10 widgets uh, three days from now. After I pay you the $100, the next day I encounter my friend Bob and I actually owe Bob $100, but I don't have it anymore. Uh, but he needs some widgets. And so I say, hey, look, Bob, I know I owe you 100 bucks. Are you willing to accept 10 widgets as payment? Bob says, well, sure, that sounds great. So I assign to Bob my interest in the widgets uh, from the other person, and that can be a way of, of, of approaching it. One thing to keep in mind is if you allow assignability, then that is, is a good fact, and very likely the courts would have, would have treated it as an assignable right, even if you didn't have it in your contract. If you want to make it not assignable, though, you ought to look into it a little bit, make sure that you have the tightest language you can have, because courts have been known not to enforce a, a no assignability provision, uh, again, outside this, the situation of personal services, if there's, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, the court will say, does this make sense for the parties to require this? A little bit of, of uh, terminology. We have an assignee. The assignee is the person who receives the assignment. Of course, the assignor would, uh, with, uh, with this way, let me just write it out. Assign or OR is the person who is assigning it. The person who's supposed to get the stuff. And keep in mind that when you think about Assignability. You see at the beginning the word, the beginning of the word asset. Um, so we have assets are assignable. That's the nature of it. Let's talk about notice. Um, you're going to have, if it's a, a lengthy contract, you're likely to want to have situations where you either are required or may provide notice. For example, again, this can work if you have an automatically renewable contract. You'll probably have a brief window of time where one or both parties can um, give notice, hey, I don't want to participate in this contract anymore. And that can be the way that it ends. There can be other things. There can be a requirement that if you receive non-conforming goods, that you give notice that they are non-conforming, and that gives the other side the opportunity to cure whatever defect might be there. So uh, notice provisions are pretty common. And you're going to want to describe how notice is given. Is it can be done by phone, by fax, by email, by letter, by certified letter? What's the mechanism? When does it need to be, get, what notice needs to be given? And what, the, what is the language that needs to be in the notice? Who, does, who has to receive that notice? Who has to send that notice? All those details you want to work out. Obviously, you want to have a signature place um, for the parties, and you want to date that uh, times. Um, sometimes the parties' names are not actually, or actually, let me regret, sometimes the names of the people signing aren't actually provided. So you might have, let's say, uh, the two contracting parties are ABC Corporation and DEF Company. Well, you might have a line to say ABC Corporation. Well, obviously, ABC Corporation is is not some uh, not a person. It can't sign anything. So you might have an agent of the company sign it. Maybe the CFO of the company, Harold Brown, signs it. Um, probably best practice would be to actually have Harold Brown's name under the line that he's going to sign and then below that uh, describe his title within the entity and then the name of the entity, in this case ABC Corporation. Um, there, there are times you have to have a signature because of the statute of fraud, so you want to make sure you have it in those situations. There can be times where you want to have a notarized signature. I mean, in that situation, obviously, you need to have a notary public there. It's pretty common for paralegals to be notaries. You don't you really don't have to be to, to be a, a paralegal, but it, it's a useful thing to have in an office. 
Uh, the dates are important in that that establishes when the contract began. Um, and so if, you, if there's a provision in the contract that says this contract stays in force for 12 months from the date of commencement, well, the dates that people sign it does become very important. And I get, again, identically, ideally, you want to specify the status. You don't want to have just one that says Harold Brown. You want to say Harold Brown, comma, Chief Financial Officer of ABC Corporation. You might even want to say Chief Financial Officer and Agent of ABC Corporation. And it's useful to keep in mind, is this person signing his personal capacity? Is Harold Brown entering into this contract for Harold Brown's benefit? And he happens to, in his business life, be the CFO of ABC Company, but maybe this is a contract he's entering into with a lawn service to mow his personal lawn. And so it's good to make it clear whether this person is entering as an individual or as an agent of another entity. And you can specify this elsewhere, but probably the most common areas at the very end of the contract where you have the signature lines. If you have a sales contract, of course, that's going to be a UCC contract. Um, You'll want to include all the particulars that the parties have agreed to, obviously, but you can keep in mind that the UCC will fill in the blanks. A lot of the UCC really is just a fill in the blank generator. It has a default setting for particular issues. So if the parties haven't specified a particular way, the UCC says, okay, the parties haven't specified, so this is what the rule is going to be. Of course, if the parties specified something different than the UCC rule, in most cases, then the parties state of preference or what's going to uh, come into effect. A specific issue to the UCC, and this really isn't specific, but you're going to want to make sure that all your terms are understandable and conspicuous. Um, uh, the, it's important to conspicuously refer to any terms represented on the re reverse side of the form. This is important when you have a merchant contracting with a consumer. Um, Go to the next. Are we have more sales uh, contract thing? So these are things that you want to have in your sales contract, in your UCC contract. You want to have the names of the parties, obviously. You want to describe the goods. We've already talked about this. Uh, you may also want to provide for n normal deviations. You know, you may want a three-inch widget, but is a 1.9-inch widget unacceptable? Maybe it's okay. You want to specify well, how much can it be off that range? You want to specify the number of goods going to be purchased. Of course, if you have an output or um, requirements contract, then um, you don't have to specify the actual amount because the pres presumption is going to be that the parties act in good faith. Um, if you aren't able to specify right now the amount, you may want to uh, list a maximum and minimum amount. Let's say I'm a farmer and I've agreed to contract to sell my wheat, all of my wheat, so it's an output contract, to a particular company. But you could have a provision that says, well, you know what, if Groover's complete wheat uh, crop dies, Groover is still required to provide at least, say, 100 bushels of wheat. And let's say that Groover had a bumper crop, I mean, more wheat than anybody would have thought her piece of land would produce. Well, maybe there'd be a, a maximum amount that the a buyer can't be forced to buy more than 1,000 uh, bushels of wheat. And so you can have maximums and minimums within an output or in requirements contract or really with, with respect to any contract. It's a way of um, removing some of that uncertainty. Okay, so um, you obviously want to include the price and how it's going to be paid, things like the method of payment, the time of payment. If there's going to be taxes, who's going to pay those taxes? If it's an installment, how will the installments be paid and will there be an acceleration provision in it? Um, if payment is condi conditioned upon a successful inspection, um, you want to describe how long that inspection is going to be and what what the nature of that inspection ought to be, what, what types of tests should the um, buyer perform before he or she accepts it, and, and what happens if the person doesn't perform those tests and they later on discover that there is a defect that could have been ascertained if they had performed those tests. Um, in addition, you're going to want to have... Um, you you want to make it clear that you if it's a if it's a sales contract you're going to be transferring title, and so um, if you want to vary uh, from from the the standard rule about when the contract is going to where the title for the merchandise is going to change hands, you want to make that very clear. <laughs> 
Um, you can specify whether uh, documents of title are going to be negotiable or non-negotiable, um, meaning um, is it something that um, can transfer um, to somebody else? In other words, they're, they're an assignable thing, or perhaps they're not trans transferable uh, to somebody else, and then they wouldn't be assignable. Let's talk about delivery. Of course, we have all the different modes. You can have a shipment contract, a destination contract, FOB, FAS, and um, um, CIF. You can, oh, I forgot what CNF stands for. A cost and freight is the ordinary, I guess it's cost, insurance, and freight. Um, again, it's easy if you just do the abbreviations, but you know if it's if if you, one party isn't as familiar with it, it may make sense for you to write it out so everybody knows um, what the the specifics might be. You may also want to include a force majeure or exculpatory clauses if those are appropriate under the circumstances. Warranties are a big deal. They're a big deal in common law contracts. They're also a big deal under the UCC. And so if you're going to exclude a warranty, boy, you have to make it very clear. Um, things like boldface or underlying, some way to make it very obvious that, in fact, you're excluding a warranty such as merchantability. The, the assumption is merchantability um, is part of any warranty. If you are excluding a warranty of fitness, you're going to want to also make that clear. There's, there's certain language you have to use under these, these situations. Again, that's why you use boilerplate. That's why you use languages from another UCC contract so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and find all the ins and outs, all the magic words you have to use in order to avoid something you don't want to have happen. Um, if the purchase on credit... Um, uh, no credit will be extended until approved, um, and the clause protects the, the seller against the buyer who becomes insolvent in the future. We talked about that possibility. It's an ongoing relationship over time. Maybe the buyer has plenty of money at first, but the economy turns south, and the buyer suddenly isn't able to pay for things. Well, that puts the the, the, the seller in a very uncomfortable position. He wants to make sure that if he delivers goods, the buyer is going to be able to pay for those goods. If you, if it's part of the contract, do you want uh, someone to have ability to get remedies outside of the framework of the UCC? You'll want to specify that as well. Um, there is a section in the textbook that talks about employment law contracts. I really wish they hadn't used that because employment law contracts really vary a lot from state to state. And it's a very complex area. And so while, yes, it is a part of the area of contract law, and so it is a contract, um, and certainly the, the concepts that we've talked about in this course are applicable to employment contracts, but there's just a lot of other stuff that go into effect. Um, and so um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that particular contract because it's um, its own thing. Here's an example. Here's some information you might want to have. And if you're selling a business, the particular uh, covenants and, and clauses that you want to have in the contract. If you have any questions, be sure to bring them to class. We'll be delighted to answer them. And thank you for your attention. I am going to end this um, at this time.